My understanding is uh, the fellows here have heard from a number of scholars and uh, thinkers uh, with respect to the history of the conservative movement and some of its ins and outs. So I know that you've heard from uh, George Nash, or at least seen videos from him, uh, that Jordan Bloom and um, several others have also addressed you. So uh, my remarks today, I think, will perhaps um, kind of put additional light or shed additional perspective on some of the topics you've already heard about and maybe help to fit them together. So, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say for sure, but knowing what I know of the other speakers, I can imagine you might be wondering how, for example, uh, the Donald Trump phenomenon might emerge from the kind of intellectual history that uh, George Nash presents, that you have, you know, these uh, traditions going back uh, really about 70 years now of, you know, rather sophisticated forms of libertarianism and uh, various kinds of conservatism, and um, all of them seem to be uh, taken by surprise by what happened in 2016, and that there seem to be things happening uh, in the politics, not just of the Republican Party, but of the country as a whole, and in particular of the sort of right side, the political right uh, here in the United States, that um, are hard to fit theoretically into the frameworks that um, have been devised over the past, uh, again, 70 years or so. Um, now, George Nash, I have you know the most tremendous respect for. He's an absolutely brilliant scholar, and I think you know all the work he does is very solid. And the question is simply how to extend that and how to sort of broaden it so that it takes account of uh, the rather surprising developments of the last uh, several years here. And uh, in order to uh, open up that question and to explore it, I will talk somewhat about um, a variety of thinkers. Uh, dating back to the early 20th century and even the late 19th century. Um, and my discussion today will be kind of a series of components, and I hope uh, how they fit together will be plain enough, but uh, I will, we will be sure to leave plenty of time for Q&A, uh, both at the end of this session and then later on in the day, so that um, we can really answer any particular questions you have and also sort of delve into the particular topics that are of most interest to you. So while I'm going to give you an overview and kind of show you how various things uh, might uh, provide context for one another, there is, uh, I think the specifics will be things that you'll want to draw out yourself and kind of that we can have a discussion about, uh, you know, in the later part of the day. So let me begin with um, a little bit of theory in a very broad sense. Um, those of you who have read uh, Plato's Republic, and I suspect that's all of you, uh, know that there is a connection between psychology and between uh, the sort of makeup of the human soul and its composition and balance and a regime, a constitution, a state. Uh, and you know, there's a, a, a correspondence between uh, psychology and psychological elements and, uh, and politics. Uh, now, this is a theme that gets developed not only uh, in Plato, but really throughout uh, you know, several centuries of Western philosophy. Um, so having thrown that out there, let me talk a little bit about some of the more recent developments that I think will be worth uh, sort of flagging up. Um, many of you will also be aware of David Hume, the 18th century uh, Scots philosopher, who, you know, uh, at a glance may seem very different from Plato. But uh, one of the things, of course, that David Hume says is that uh, reason is the slave of the passions. Now, that sounds, again, very unplatonic because it sounds as if, uh, you know, instead of the philosopher king uh, being, uh, you know, over those who have thumos and over those who are simply appetitive, uh, instead Hume seems to be saying that, you know, perhaps the uh, appetitive and thymotic elements, the passions, are the ones that are ruling uh, the rational element. I think there's, it's actually a little more sophisticated. I won't get into sort of the details of how you might try to balance Plato and Hume and actually kind of synthesize the two of them together. What I want to flag up here is simply that Hume, like Plato, as different as they may seem to be, also um, you know, is pointing to uh, the relationship of, um, of passions and emotions to reason and to politics. Um, so these things all have some relationship, and what that relationship is is something that <clears throat> remains very much contentious. It's something uh, that there are different schools of thought about, uh, but it's really one of the central topics in Western political philosophy and really all political philosophy. Would, I, would it be possible for me to get a, another bottle of water? Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> 
In the late 19th and uh, early 20th century, a uh, school of thought emerges primarily in Italy uh, and a number of sort of uh, culturally Italian regions of Switzerland and elsewhere, um, focusing on the relationship of reason and passion in politics. Thank you. Basically, uh, over the course of the 19th century, a certain very uh, highly refined idea of reason, something that's uh, you know, much more modern, uh, much more technical perhaps in some respects than what you find in Plato, uh, comes to be seen as uh, the basis for all reason. Uh, you wind up with a 19th century rationalism that is uh, you know, in some ways rather de desiccated, in some ways rather uh, sort of removed from uh, real human sentiment, real human experience and feeling. Uh, it becomes, you know, highly positivistic, it becomes very highly um, abstracted. Um, but it's not just an abstraction that's, you know, sort of deep into theory. It's an abstraction that's based also on the rise of statistics in the uh, late 19th century. It's based on um, really what, you know, sort of rationalism as a... Um, uh, a term that we might look up askance upon today. Um, this is something that develops in the late 19th century. And there were a number of thinkers at the time who rejected it, who looked at the, the kind of rationalism that was connected to classical liberalism, for example, and who said that um, this is basically nonsense. This is not describing how human beings actually behave, and this is not describing um, how politics actually works. So as I say, you have this um, Italian school of thought in particular that develops. And uh, three of the key figures in this are Gaetano Mosca, who lives from 1858 to 1941, Vilfredo Pareto, who lives from 1848 to 1923, and Roberto Michaels, who lives from 1876 to 1936. And of these three, uh, Pareto is probably uh, even now uh, you know, sort of the most highly regarded. Pareto is sort of a genius, something of a Renaissance man. He is an engineer, he's an economist. Uh, even now, you know, concepts of Pareto optimality and um, uh, the power rule, these things are still concepts that are used in economics today. Um, but he moves from economics into uh, a form of sociology, a highly philosophical form of sociology basically because he becomes frustrated. He comes to think that economics does not really describe all of human life and the, and the fundamental functioning of society. Um, the work for which he's probably best known is uh, called The Mind and Society in its English translation. It's four volumes and um, it's not the most exciting reading. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather dense, uh, but it is, uh, and it's not really in print these days. It's a little hard to track down copies, uh, but it's a very important work. And uh, some of what I'll be describing today, discussing uh, is sort of derived from uh, Pareto at one or two generations removed. Um, so Pareto comes to uh, develop a theory about um, the irrational impulses or the irrational sort of tendencies that actually drive politics. And he, um, he calls these residues. They're, his reasoning for calling them residues is a little, uh, would take a few minutes to describe, but basically they're what, what's left over, they're what remains once you take away the things that um, Pareto says are not really operational and the things that are not really driving people's behavior. Um, now, of the residues, he divides them up into several classes, so several categories of what um, actually are the primary motives for human actions, especially in politics. And really, the first two of these classes, the first two sets of residues, are the ones that matter most. The first one, class one, uh, consists of the instinct for combinations, uh, the second class consists of the persistence of aggregates. Now, both of those sound uh, very sort of broad and general. What do they possibly mean? Well, the instinct for combinations is the sort of uh, philosophical uh, or rather psychological um, preference for novelty, for um, uh, putting things together in interesting and, and different ways, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, not being fixed, but rather preferring to um, sort of reassort things, reshuffle the deck, and uh, understand things in new ways. And it has both admirable and less admirable qualities. 
Um, the point here is not not to make a moral judgment about this uh, residue. It's not to uh, you know say whether it's intellectually correct or incorrect. It's simply to say that this is one of the sort of underlying psychological elements that you find in people who are involved in politics, is whether or not they have this instinct for combinations. The second uh, set of class, uh, sort, of, sort of class of residues rather, uh, is the persistence of aggregates. Now this is um, basically, uh, you may have heard this uh, rather silly term tribalism recently, uh, describing basically any kind of affection for any kind of group, um, which I think is not really a concept for which we should use the word tribalism because a tribe is a very specific kind of group, but that's simply a, uh, um, you know, a di digression. Um, the persistence of aggregate simply means uh, you know, things like loyalty, for example. It means the uh, idea that uh, the combinations that already exist, whether in society or whether in, um, in theory and intellectual constructs, these are the things that we should remain attached to. So it's the opposite of the um, instinct for combinations. Instead of breaking things up and putting them together in new ways, it's rather a devotion to the existing uh, you know, way that things are put together. Well, in addition to these uh, residues, which are sort of primary psychological drivers, Pareto also has a concept uh, that he uh, refers to as derivations. And these are sort of um, after the fact rationalizations or justifications for um, ideas and for actions that one really adopts for irrational reasons. So. You know, if you're a classical liberal or if you're someone who looks at politics in a very conventional way based on, you know, sort of the social science of the uh, uh, you know, early to mid-19th century, you, you think of things as working this way, that people are kind of rational actors. They, you know, take a set of ideas that, you know, they then weigh on purely rational grounds, and then they go with whatever seems to make the most sense. Um, that's the sort of conventional picture. And Pareto is basically um, saying that's not the way it works at all. That in fact people come to politics already having certain tendencies towards either combinations or support of things that already exist. And they, um, they then adopt some of the ideas, some of the frameworks that are already out there that um, basically uh, support their, their preconceived notions. Um, you may have uh, heard a lot of talk recently about... Um, what is the phrase they use today? It's um, confirmation bias. Um, so basically, this, these, these, you know, the terms themselves get renovated from time to time, uh, but the concepts are fairly old. The idea that there is uh, a confirmation bias, that people are seeing in evidence, people are seeing in sophisticated theories really what they want to see, that they're already coming to the table with a lot of uh, preferences already built in. So derivations um, are sets of ideas that um, look like they are kind of carefully reasoned out um, worldviews, but that are in fact uh, just you know sort of sophisticated justifications uh, for things that people might already believe. It's very similar actually to the way that um, Karl Marx uses the concept of ideology. So for Marx, you know, he believes that um, materialism is basically the basis for everything and that ideological constructs are simply rationalizations for uh, material dispensations of power. Uh, Pareto is not a Marxist, but you can see that there are certain parallels between the way he has constructed things and the way that Marx does. Both of them are actually very critical of uh, sort of classical liberalism and 19th century um, sort of uh, rationalism. Well, Pareto's ideas are very influential in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, but I really want to talk about um, someone who brings them into uh, the American context in the 1940s. So a very interesting uh, figure uh, of the uh, mid-century uh, American intellectual milieu is a fellow by the name of James Burnham. And uh, he is a professor at New York University in the uh, 1930s. And he actually becomes the leading American intellectual disciple and expositor of Leon Trotsky. Trotsky is, um, you know, one of the uh, original Bolsheviks, uh, one of the Russian revolutionaries. He's the most intellectual of the Russian revolutionaries. He writes a, um, uh, you know, a still very highly regarded, uh, although of course quite slanted, uh, history of the Russian Revolution. 
Um, so Trotsky is, you know, he's sort of the uh, almost a Renaissance man himself in, as a revolutionary. He's a military commander. Uh, one of the uh, actually most disgraceful things he's involved with is a massacre of sailors who are revolting against, um, you know, uh, poor conditions on their ships at uh, the port of Kronstadt. Uh, but Trotsky is one of the major uh, military commanders in the, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, he's an intellectual, however, as well as being a, um, uh, a p political figure, a revolutionary, and a military commander. So Trotsky is an impressive guy. He's a bad guy, but he's certainly someone who has to be taken seriously. And uh, James Burnham, I think, you know, finds a certain uh, find something fascinating about this character, especially uh, the fact that he's an intellectual who's also someone who's kind of a world historical figure. Um, Trotsky is a very romantic figure for the American left uh, up to about 1939 because um, by that point the American left has seen that the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and the Soviet Union has become very repressive. I mean, it actually was from the very beginning, but, you know, during Lenin's rule they were able to kind of uh, close their eyes and pretend that it was actually a worker's paradise. And then when Stalin uh, takes power, uh, it becomes very hard even for the sort of um, most utopian leftists to pretend that what's happening in the Soviet Union is not just sheer tyranny. Um, but Trotsky, because he winds, out, winds up being thrown out by, uh, by Stalin, and Stalin actually has assassins you know, set out to kill him, Trotsky becomes this very romantic figure of kind of uh, what if, you know, if only Trotsky instead of Stalin had succeeded uh, Lenin, then would the Soviet Union have been the workers' paradise and the, the kind of state that um, uh, its uh, propagandists had pretended that it would be. Um, so Trotsky is this figure of, you know, quite a great appeal uh, to the American left and, and to American intellectuals who already in the 1920s and 1930s are um, drifting quite considerably to the left. And Burnham, who's a very young professor at New York University, uh, becomes, uh, you know, very interested in Trotsky and, um, you know, is kind of uh, considered a leading Trotskyist theorist in the United States. But Burnham is an honest intellectual, so he keeps thinking about Marxism, he keeps thinking about Trotsky's theories of history, and he comes to uh, the belief that actually uh, they don't add up, and that in fact the Soviet Union under Stalin really is um, pretty much what you would expect uh, you know, the sort of communist effort to become, that it was not a, a corruption of a, you know, perfect worker state, rather that it was, in fact, uh, sort of the inevitable outcome of, of Bolshevism. And um, this leads Burnham, uh, over time, to start to, um, you know, sort of rethink the whole sort of Marxist uh, theoretical worldview. Uh, so Marxism, of course, you know, has this um, uh, world historical pattern, where you go from you know, kind of a rural agricultural feudal economy to uh, an industrial economy. That's an era where liberalism starts to flourish, but then ultimately you know, the workers are dissatisfied by capitalism and industrialism and liberalism. The workers rise up, you have a revolution, and then you eventually get the uh, sort of workers' paradise, the uh, sort of uh, uh, the, the state itself, you know, after being taken over by the workers, sort of melts away and you get this sort of happily ever after story of human equality and so forth. And uh, Burnham says, well, you know what, this, this theory is not only wrong, but it's wrong at an earlier stage than many of the Marxists may realize. That in fact, what seems to be succeeding capitalism, that is 19th century capitalism, what seems to be replacing that is not worker control. It's actually control of economies uh, by a new category, a new class of economic actors by people uh, that James Burnham identifies as managers. So in 1941, he writes a book called The Managerial Revolution, which is basically, um, it symbolizes his break with Trotskyism, his break with Marxism. He's basically saying that he has a very different theory of how um, the you know, sort of economy throughout the world and in you know, a variety of nations is developing. And in terms of the managerial state and the managerial economy, um, he points to all of the major leading powers of that time as being examples of this. So Nazi Germany is one, uh, the Soviet Union is another, but also uh, the Western economies, uh, you know, uh, the New Deal United States and um, the uh, Great Britain as it goes into World War II. Um, all of these states are now characterized by um, sort of technocrats and bureaucrats being the most important people in the economy, 
whether those technocrats and bureaucrats are directly employed by government and are then controlling industry, as in uh, both Nazi Germany and in the Soviet Union, or whether those technocrats and bureaucrats are actually employed by, you know, supposedly, uh, you know, sort of free companies, which are not directly controlled by the state, but which nonetheless, uh, you know, have this same sort of category of technocratic, bureaucratic individuals who have the same training as their counterparts in government and who have the same sort of mindset and outlook and who are actually the ones who are controlling factory production and, uh, you know, sort of the means of uh, uh, economic material wealth, uh, whereas, you know, the capitalist class are now somewhat divorced from uh, what's going on on the factory floor and they're, you know, they're now, uh, they hold, they're holding shares, but they have much less sort of concrete connection than in the 19th century when you had more personal ownership with what's actually happening in the, um, uh, in the economy. So both in free economies and also in these totalitarian economies, you actually see this new category of uh, you know, manager um, rising to power. And Burnham says this is actually very significant and this is going to be uh, you know, something that will um, we'll be replacing capitalism as we knew it in the 19th century. Now, James Burnham's 1941 book, The Managerial Revolution, um, it talks about you know, this change in economics uh, it also talks about sort of the situation of uh, the various world powers. Burnham says that uh, basically because of the um, sort of usefulness of economies of scale uh, and for a variety of you know, strategic reasons as well, you're going to wind up with the world consolidating into a number of large sort of supranational blocks that, uh, you know, sort of North America, you know, the United States in particular, is going to be one big power block that um, basically the European heartland, probably controlled by Nazi Germany, is going to be a second power block, and then that um, Manchuria and East Asia is going to be a third power block in the long run. Manchuria is already at this point a pretty important, uh, you know, sort of relatively more highly industrialized part of, of East Asia, and Burnham is predicting that to kind of grow and grow. Um, the Soviet Union is interesting because Burnham, based on his background with communism, is actually rather more, um, he sees the Soviet Union as less successful in some ways as a managerial economy than either Nazi Germany or New Deal America. So he's looking at these things through a, um, you know, sort of a, um, a, a theoretical lens that is not just, you know, trying to say what he likes, you know, what his preferences are, but rather, you know, sort of how things are actually working out, what, um, how states and economies are developing in all of these different places. Um, Burnham's book becomes very, very influential. So uh, George Orwell's um, 1984 actually is in some ways a direct fictionalization of Burnham's book. You'll remember that in 1984 uh, you have Oceania, uh, East Asia, uh, sorry, East Asia? Yeah, it is East Asia, and Eurasia. These correspond to the geographic power blocks that, um, that Burnham talks about. Uh, there are various other elements of 1984 which parallel uh, elements of Burnham's managerial revolution. Uh, Orwell had actually read Burnham. He reviewed uh, both the managerial revolution and some of uh, Burnham's uh, subsequent work as well. So uh, you can see that this was something that people were taking uh, very seriously back in the 1940s. So that's sort of uh, the beginning of James Burnham. He's someone who has this sort of uh, sympathy with Trotsky at one point but then kind of rejects Trotskyism and becomes actually quite uh, strongly anti-communist uh, because he has a very, you know, sort of, uh, he knows exactly what the Soviet Union is and how, how awful it is. Um, now people, you know, because Burnham makes some predictions in 1941 that uh, apparently don't come true, um, today, in 2018, a lot of people think, oh, the managerial revolution is, you know, uh, not really all that important of a book because he got his Burnham got certain things wrong. So one of the things Burnham has as a prediction in in, uh, in uh, the managerial revolution is that Nazi Germany is going to prevail in World War II, and of course that didn't happen. So uh, people think, oh well, you know, bad prediction, therefore you know probably based on a bad theory. Well, there's actually two things to note about this. Um, one is that when Burnham talked about Nazi Germany prevailing in World War II. He was talking about the state of World War II at the time he was writing the book. 
which was, uh, you know, before the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany have uh, gone to war with one another. It's before the United States has been brought into the war. It's basically at the time at which Nazi Germany is fighting Great Britain. And he says, you know, in that battle, uh, Great Britain is not going to be the winner. And he is sort of correct about that. Great Britain is able to survive the Nazi onslaught. Uh, but if it were not for the U.S. and the USSR also getting into the war against Nazi Germany, um, it seems much more likely that Burnham's prediction would have come true. And Burnham does also predict, uh, you know, in, in uh, the managerial revolution, that basically you're going to see these very long-term conflicts uh, between these, you know, sort of three great power blocks. And in that, too, he proves to be, I think, more right than wrong. You have to, you know, sort of uh, provide the details for yourself as you look at history, but you can see the general shape of things is quite similar to what Burnham predicted. I actually think Burnham's managerial revolution is well worth reconsidering today in light of communist China. Because when people think about communist China, they point to it and they say, well, this is not really classic communism, right? This is do doesn't look exactly like the Soviet Union. But, but clearly what, what, what uh, the People's Republic of China has today is not capitalism either. It doesn't resemble our idea of what a free economy is. So what is it if it's neither a free capitalist economy nor a classic Soviet-style communist economy? Well, in fact, it looks to me very much like exactly what uh, Burnham had described as a managerial economy. Um, and the, even if you look at the leadership class uh, in China, that it you know, tends to be uh, you know, these older bureaucrats who... Uh, oftentimes have a background in industry. They've often been, uh, you know, sometimes they've worked as engineers, but they're technocratic. They're very smart guys. Um, these two uh, sort of reflect uh, the managerial class that Burnham described in 1941. Well, the managerial revolution is only sort of uh, part of what makes Burnham so interesting. He then, in 1943, publishes a very different book, where he looks back at uh, Vilfredo Pareto and Roberto Michaels and Gaetano Mosca. Uh, this 1943 book is called The Machiavellians, and he basically points to the relationship between uh, these uh, sort of early 20th century uh, Italian social thinkers, who again emphasize the irrational element of politics. He points to the relationship of them uh, to Machiavelli, and he basically says that um, some of the categories that Machiavelli describes are things that you can actually find uh, reflected in the work of Pareto, for example. So Machiavelli, drawing upon Cicero, um, talks about uh, you know, human psychological types as lions and foxes. And uh, Burnham says that these actually correspond to, uh, to Pareto's class one and class two uh, residues. So uh, foxes, they are the people who have this uh, sort of love of novelty. They are uh, people who prefer fraud to force when it comes to uh, advancing an agenda in politics. Uh, they're clever people. They're verbalists. Uh, lions, on the other hand, are people who prefer force to fraud. They're people who um, like to, you know, they have this group adhesion. They have this sort of tribalist element. And uh, they have a, a great sense of honor, a great sense of pride. They have a lot of what Plato described as, uh, as thumos. Um, whereas the foxes, the foxes don't really correspond directly to those who possessed uh, what Plato would describe as logos or reason, uh, but they are clever. They have a kind of degraded sort of, uh, of reason. Um, so in the rest of my discussion, I'll, I'll primarily use the terms foxes and lions as opposed to uh, class one and class two residues because I think lions and foxes are a bit more concrete and easy to uh, sort of get a handle upon. So Burnham writes this book, uh, The Machiavellians, about um, these uh, psychological types and about how they interact and how they are the basis for uh, different kinds of political regimes. And um, basically, uh, what Burnham starts to draw out, both in The Machiavellians and some of his later work, is the idea that the leadership class in the West has become uh, sort of overrun by people who are psychological foxes. They have this uh, sort of love of novel combinations. They, liberalism itself, liberalism itself, as Burnham explains in a, uh, his final book, his 1964 book, The Death of the West, The Suicide of the West, rather, um, Liberalism itself is the ideology, the derivation, the sort of ex post facto justification for the psychological attributes that um, liberals already possess. Uh, so 
liberalism as an ideology, you can see, reflects this preference for novelty, this idea of sort of putting things together in new combinations, this preference for um, uh, cleverness over loyalty, all the uh, characteristics that you find uh, in a great many liberal policies, you know, whether it's um, you know, classical liberalism to some extent, but certainly to modern left liberalism to a very great extent, uh, they reflect these uh, underlying psychological tendencies. So Burnham's theory is actually very powerful for accounting for why liberalism is the sort of thing it is. Why is liberalism so anti-American? Why does liberalism endorse multiculturalism? Why does liberalism always see sort of colonial liberation movements, even when they lead to dictatorship in the third world? Why does liberalism tend to see those things as good and always see sort of Western influences on other countries as imperialistic and bad? Well, it's because of some of these underlying psychological um, you know, uh, generators of uh, preferences. Now, Burnham uh, becomes, uh, thanks to his anti-communism, a very important early figure in the creation of National Review in 1953. Um, Burnham uh, becomes almost a father figure to William F. Buckley, Jr. Uh, and in fact, uh, when, when Bill Buckley's father, uh, real father, dies, Buckley writes a letter to Burnham and says, basically, you know, you're the closest thing I have to a father now. He describes Burnham as being his paramount collaborator uh, at National Review. Um, Burnham, you know, despite having these, you know, very kind of, uh, in some ways, radical views about politics and world affairs and so forth, uh, is a surprisingly sort of conventional guy when it comes to uh, electoral politics. He's actually a Rockefeller Republican, something of a moderate compared to uh, many of his uh, colleagues at National Review. So all of that is giving you sort of a, a, um, a basis for something that we will come back to. Uh, the second part of my remarks here is going to talk about the conservative movement and how it comes to be what it is. You have um, obviously the beginning of National Review in 1953. And in its first you know, decade, even two, first two decades, National Review is not, um, it's not just propounding a formula for conservatism. You don't get you know, something that's um, sort of uh, reduced to a, a kind of easy um, you know, consensus uh, agreement as to what conservatism is. That in fact, the various thinkers at National Review have a wide range of opinions which overlap. They do have a center of gravity. Uh, but there are distinct differences among them. So um, you have Burnham, whose views I've already described here. You have uh, Brent Bozell, who is uh, Bill Buckley's brother-in-law. And Bozell is um, what today would generally be called a, a Catholic integralist. He's someone who looks at uh, Roman Catholic Spain and sees Spain as being you know, a, a good example to the rest of the world. And he, you know, Bozell is someone who believes that um, the Catholic Church in particular and Christianity in general should have a much more uh, powerful, powerful role in American public life, uh, whether or not in law, certainly in terms of setting the sort of cultural um, presuppositions according to which uh, our laws are devised. Um, you have others. You have uh, Frank Meyer, for example, who is a senior editor at National Review uh, in the uh, 1950s and 60s. Frank Meyer becomes the prophet of this idea of fusionism. And fusionism is actually something more interesting and sophisticated than you may have heard from other sources. Um, fusionism is a, a rather serious attempt to find a philosophical common ground, not just a political sort of alliance of convenience, but a philosophical common thread behind both uh, traditionalism, uh, especially on the you know, sort of Christian traditionalist side, and uh, you know, a sort of devotion to liberty that is parallel to libertarianism. Uh, is there a sort of common basis in Western political thought to both of these uh, sorts of rather different and sometimes at odds um, factions on the right? Um, so Frank Meyer tries very hard to, to find out what that could be. And um, if you pick up uh, Frank Meyer's book, In Defense of Freedom, there's a Liberty Fund edition that was published in 1996. And the best part of that book is actually an essay at the very end of it, uh, which was added um, after the fact. Uh, it was one of uh, Frank, uh, Frank Meyer's late essays, and um, I think it's just called Western Civilization. And it's actually a very good attempt at creating this uh, synthesis at a philosophical level and by looking at sort of the role of the incarnation and the role of Christianity in uh, sort of bringing the sort of um, uh, the philosophical and the principled 
into contact with the earthly and uh, the, um, the sort of living context of humanity. Um, so I really highly recommend that essay as something that will shed a very different light on fusionism than what you might hear from Jonah Goldberg or from any number of thinkers today who look at it as primarily uh, just a means of winning an election by putting together a coalition of people who really don't agree on philosophical principles. Uh, Frank Meyer was actually engaged in a more serious project than that. Whether Meyer was successful is a different question, but, um, but I do recommend at least taking, taking him and his ideas seriously. So National Review, you know, in the 50s and 60s, is characterized by some very different uh, sets of not only philosophical principles, but also political preferences. So again, James Burnham is a Rockefeller Republican. Today we would call that basically kind of a liberal Republican. Um, others uh, at National Review, um, some of them are sort of quasi-pragmatic, and Bill Buckley himself falls into this category. Um, Bill Buckley winds up supporting Barry Goldwater in 1964, but it's a little bit reluctantly, and he actually views Goldwater as um, someone who's almost certainly going to lose. And um, Burnham argued very strenuously um, with National Review not to endorse uh, Goldwater because he said Goldwater was a surefire failure and loser. So Buckley was kind of torn. On the other hand, you had others at National Review, such as uh, Bill Rickenbacker and uh, the publisher, Bill Rusher, who were very pro-Goldwater and who, in fact, um, were very much opposed to the Republican establishment. And um, even though uh, the specific issues may be very different, you can see, especially in Bill Rusher, someone who um, kind of prefigures the Donald Trump kind of um, uh, dissatisfaction with the Republican establishment and a desire to do things very differently. Um, by around uh, the late 1970s, Bill Rusher is actually talking about trying to start a third party, a, a conservative third party, because he thinks the Republican Party is just hopelessly sort of establishmentarian and, uh, and centrist. Um, so you have, you know, instead of a, a simple conservative orthodoxy, a simple formulaic definition of conservatism, you actually have kind of an interesting mix of ideas uh, at the early National Review. Well, in addition to the um, struggles that National Review is having, uh, you know, these joyful struggles to try to define conservatism among these different factions, uh, there are other ways of looking at conservatism, too, um, as, you know, sort of not being a, a quest for any kind of ideology at all, but as being a matter of temperament or uh, a matter of uh, sort of pragmatism. So, you know, someone like uh, Dwight Eisenhower, in retrospect, I think is viewed by many people as being quite conservative. Even though he accepted the New Deal, he didn't try to um, uh, get rid of it, as many uh, Republicans at the time had hoped. Uh, even though Eisenhower is in some respects kind of a, uh, a somewhat big government guy, I mean, the Federal Highway Project is itself uh, certainly a big infrastructure project. Uh, nevertheless, you know, Eisenhower, um, you know, kind of doesn't engage in any kind of radical policies. He's someone who kind of uh, just keeps America in a good, steady uh, condition. And in that sense, you know, he seems like someone who is conservative in a certain non-ideological way, in a, just a, a sort of um, prudential way. And you can also look for a prudential kind of uh, conservatism at the philosophical level. So there's a very important English philosopher by the name of Michael Oakeshott who um, talks about conservatism in this light. And he has a 1956 essay called On Being Conservative, where he basically you know, talks about this uh, kind of temperamental uh, kind of conservatism, which is a preference for uh, not rocking the boat. He has this, this wonderful um, analogy where he talks about conservatism as you know, being like uh, going out uh, on a fishing expedition. You're just on a boat, you know, you're casting your reel, you're drawing in fish, but you're just doing it because you enjoy it. You're just sustaining this practice because it is, you know, there's uh, it's just a certain way of doing it. It's not really aimed at achieving something concrete, right? Um, if you just go out, uh, you know, on the boat to do a little recreational fishing, you're not trying to achieve something grandiose. You're not trying to uh, change the world or, uh, you know, um, pull in enough fish to, you know, make a lot of money or something like that. It's just something you're doing for the sake of enjoyment. And although that may sound kind of trivializing, what Oakeshott's actually getting at is that conservatism is about life itself. It's about, you know, sustaining the life we have, as opposed to um, the way that um, all these kinds of left-wing and other ideologies, these rationalist ideologies, look at politics and look at human life, which is that we're all meant to be sort of uh, turned into an army or some turned into some sort of a factory to produce something or to conquer something, that we have to, you know, organize in politics in order to bring about 
perfect equality or in order to bring about, uh, you know, sort of perfect liberty. Um, Oakeshott says, actually, the life we already have is primarily the thing we have to preserve and enjoy. And that, um, and that it is good. So there's a deep conservatism in Oakeshott that um, I'm only kind of giving uh, the sort of most superficial sort of um, characteristics of that I recommend investigating and thinking through because it's different from the kind of activist idea that uh, you know, most Americans think of when they think of politics. And yet it's a very profound idea and I think uh, quite a sound one. So you have these various different kinds of conservatism. And at the time, you know, in the 1960s, uh, conservatism is not the defining ideology of the Republican Party. Uh, in fact, you know, the Republican Party is very much divided between the Rockefeller Republicans, who are kind of moderates, and uh, Goldwaterites, who are quite conservative. Uh, Goldwater, of course, loses badly in 1964. Uh, in 1968, the Republican nominee is Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon is someone who is a little bit distrusted by all of the factions of the Republican Party and also by uh, all the factions of intellectual conservatism. Um, you know, Richard Nixon clearly is not a sort of Brent Bozell Catholic traditionalist. He's clearly not a sort of hardcore, you know, sort of libertarian. He's not a Von Mises guy or something like that. Um, uh, Nixon is a cold warrior, but as a cold warrior, we'll see, of course, during the course of his administration, that he um, pursues detente with the Soviet Union. He, um, uh, you know, has this opening to China where he basically, as far as many conservatives are concerned, sort of betrays the Taiwanese who had been the, the, the Chinese people that we had supported, the uh, Chinese nationalists, and instead embraces, you know, Mao Zedong and uh, Chinese um, communism. He welcomes them into the world community and, you know, sort of um, establishes relatively friendly relations between communist China and the United States. So Nixon uh, is someone that all the factions of the right kind of have um, intellectual suspicions of and political suspicions of. And yet, as I think uh, your sections on Nixon have shown you, um, Nixon becomes a very popular figure with conservative voters. Um, you know, he has, he first of all prevails both in the primaries and in the general election in 1968. And then, of course, in 1972, he has an enormous re-election victory against uh, George McGovern. And uh, the themes that Nixon sort of brings out in the course of his campaign, the idea of the silent majority, for example, the idea that, um, you know, we have to stand uh, tough against radical politics that would make, you know, crime explode in this country. These are themes that you see Donald Trump pick up uh, 40 years later. So, interestingly enough, despite the fact that, you know, various conservatives thought that uh, Richard Nixon was not, you know, uh, philosophically pure enough, Nixon winds up connecting with voters in a way that, um, you know, many more philosophically pure um, avatars of conservatism didn't seem to do. And you see a, a very, you know, clear repeat of this in 2016, where again, when Donald, when Donald Trump starts running for office, you see, you know, National Review actually devotes a full issue uh, claim, to claiming, you know, Donald Trump is not a conservative. On all of these, you know, particular issues, Donald Trump is not reliable as a, you know, someone who's going to follow conservative policies. Uh, they say, you know, Donald Trump has bad character. Donald Trump is, you know, sort of um, inflaming voters with racial rhetoric and other things. They say that Donald Trump is, uh, you know, just doesn't have a grounding in the ideas and ethos of American conservatism. And yet, again, uh, Republican voters actually like Donald Trump. They like him better than they do people who have more sort of formulaic, checking-the-box styles of conservatism that seem to be sort of orthodox and more acceptable to, you know, to National Review and to other um, publications and other sort of uh, leading intellectual conservatives. So something interesting happens here, right? You have conservatism, on the one hand, go from being kind of uh, fractious and divided into many factions to being um, by, you know, sort of the late 70s, something that has a certain degree of orthodoxy, both about um, tax cuts, supply side becomes an orthodoxy very quickly, uh, about shrinking the size of government. You know, it continues to be, uh, you know, uh, very strongly anti-Soviet, um, and it becomes uh, quite socially conservative as well. It's, you know, sort of critical of Roe v. Wade. It's critical of uh, the push for gay rights, etc. cetera. Um, so conservatism, you know, kind of gets to have a... Um, a certain kind of definition, ideologically speaking, by the end of the 1970s. And at that point, it's also become a, a quite potent force within the Republican Party. You see more and more uh, Congress people, for example, describe themselves as conservatives. 
And you see this idea, especially with Ronald Reagan becoming president, that the Republican Party is a philosophically, ideologically conservative party. So even as you have that, however, there's always this other side, which seems to be that um, you know Republican voters uh, seem to embrace some, something that's slightly different. Uh, it can be Nixon and the silent majority, or it can be Trump and uh, his idea of America first. There seems to be a disconnection between the formulas of conservatism, the policies and the sort of articulated philosophy, and the way that voters actually behave. Voters who, in all other respects, seem to be quite conservative, you know, both personally, both in how they live their lives, and also, you know, philosophically for the most part, too. I mean, they, certainly these voters want, uh, you know, sort of uh, smaller, uh, smaller government and lower taxes. Um, so what accounts for this disconnection? Well, you can see here that this is why I talked about the irrational basis of politics and why I talked about these psychological types. Because it seems to me that the simplest and clearest and best explanation for this division between uh, the conservative or the sort of uh, right-wing grassroots and the conservative movement as a sort of philosophical project lies in these different psychological types. That um, the conservative, the, the, the right-wing grassroots are people in whom uh, class two residues or lion-like uh, personalities or thumos are very strong. They're, they are people who believe in their sort of group cohesion. And, you know, the left is always claiming that, oh, this is, you know, sort of white identity politics or whatever. Well, it's really not. It's just a fundamental devotion to the America in which these people have lived all of their lives. And it's not, you know, an all-white America. America's always had, you know, a it's always had, you know, a black population, certainly. And it's always had a mix of other people as well. Um, but it's that, you know, it's the particular mix that these people are devoted to. They don't see a need to transform America into something radically different from what it's been before. These are people who are still loyal to the idea of America as being a primarily Christian country. They're still people who are loyal to the idea that we have a historical tradition that we can uh, date back to, uh, you know, to Great Britain and to our own colonial period and to the Founding Fathers. Um, and this is radically different, of course, from the philosophy you find among not just the philosophy but also the sort of uh, temperamental and psychological outlook that you find among liberals, where they embrace this idea of novel novelty, they love the idea of combinations, they are foxes instead of lions. They like the idea of, you know, change just for the sake of change. Uh, and of course, it's change that they themselves, as intellectuals, will always have a certain amount of, um, of power over, right? So in traditional communities, where traditional authorities are important, Intellectuals can contribute something, but they're not running the show. They're simply, you know, a part of society as opposed to being on top of it. But when society is broken up and traditional authorities have been weakened, then intellectuals have uh, much more, I mean, it's, it's the old uh, sort of uh, ethic of divide and rule, right? Um, if you break things up, then you're able to use your cleverness to kind of manipulate the different factions and stay on top. So there is a, you know, a certain incentive uh, the foxes have, as well as a psychological predisposition to smash existing authorities and to create uh, a very different kind of America in terms of its religion, in terms of its, you know, sort of political ethos, in terms of how it looks at its past, uh, and so forth. Now, conservatives as a intellectual movement, as a group of magazines and think tanks and professional politicians, is in a very awkward position. Because on the one hand, the philosophy that it wants to affirm, uh, you would think would have to be the philosophy of the lions. It would be the philosophy of people who want to defend America, want to defend uh, you know, our existing traditions. And yet, the people who wind up uh, being uh, sort of in journalism and in think tanks and so forth uh, tend to be foxes. They tend to be people who um, uh, prioritize cleverness uh, and even you know, sort of novel arguments over being uh, just uh, sort of inarticulate defenders of tradition. So on the one hand, the people who are creating conservative arguments are often themselves psychological foxes. It doesn't mean they're liberals, but it does mean they have something in common with many liberals. Uh, they are foxes who are trying to speak for the lions. And that, I think, is where you see this disconnect start to emerge. And you can see it profoundly because so much of what the conservative movement talks about as a kind of intellectual project is of marginal relevance to the defense of America as a traditional nation state and as a traditional 
a group of people who have a particular heritage, right? So, you know, tax rates, yes, they're important. Lower taxes are better than higher taxes. Uh, that's great for the economy. The economy is vitally important as well. But these questions of economics and sort of how to optimize, uh, you know, uh, performance for the economy are rather different from the existential question of, is America a country? Is it a country that has a particular kind of personality based on its history? Or should it become something different, which is what the left argues, that America should transform into something that, you know, looks more like a, uh, you know, uh, the United Nations, something that looks, you know, uh, that doesn't defend our own borders, that doesn't defend uh, the idea that we have a certain moral tradition, and that instead says, no, we can now create a new tradition. We don't like our old traditions because they're all tainted by racism and, you know, slavery and everything. Therefore, they are entirely bad and must be thrown out. And we can just rationally create a perfectly good, just new system because we are much more enlightened individuals in the 21st century and uh, therefore we will create a greater sense of justice. And in order to uh, enact that sense of justice, in order to make that theory a reality, we of course have to destroy all the old authorities that are standing in the way because they're essentially, even if they're not uh, deliberately uh, being racist, they are structurally racist, they are you know, sort of embedded in this old way of doing things that is horrible and that we have rationally thought of a much better way of doing things. Well, of course, again, uh, I think a degree of skepticism about uh, rationality is called for here because, you know, communism, in theory, sounds very, very good. It's about, you know, uh, everyone does as much work as they're capable of doing. Well, that's good. People should be industrious, right? They do the work they're capable of doing, and then everyone gets whatever they need, not just, you know, um, if you're not capable of doing a lot of work, but you need a lot of resources, a lot of help, then communism says, well, you do the work you can do, and we give you all the help you need, and there doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one trade off. Well, it sounds very nice in theory, right? Uh, and of course, we see how it works out in practice. Uh, we see it right now in Venezuela. We see it uh, with, um, uh, I mean, Venezuela obviously is, you know, even by socialist standards, is a basket case. Uh, but we saw it in the Soviet Union. We've seen it in, you know, so many other examples that having high ideals and trying to translate those ideals into a, you know, nice sounding, simple, simple in one respect, you know, in terms of its sort of moral clarity, but complex in other respects in terms of, you know, Marxists write, you know, whole libraries full of books explaining how their theory is going to work out in practice. And yet all of this intellectual edifice of Marxism is worthless and in fact is less than worthless. It's actually destructive and leads to outcomes that are, uh, you know, extreme inequality between the, the commissars who actually run things and the people who are oppressed and, you know, wind up being spied upon and then ultimately tortured and, and imprisoned if they try to resist the system. That basically the Western tradition, for all of its flaws, is obviously far better than the Marxist kind of intellectual rationalistic alternative. And I think that is equally true when it comes to today's sort of multicultural, post-national, uh, globalist, um, open borders, free trade, and, uh, you know, sort of... Um, uh, human rights based uh, ideology that you find really being driven by the left but also accepted by a great many conservatives that this too just like Marxism is a intellectual edifice that really is utopian and what it leads to in practice is very different from what it uh, proclaims in theory what does it lead to in practice well of course it's very curious that on the one hand uh, this global economic system we have today uh, tends to be defended by libertarians and others as being uh, an expression of capitalism. But it's very odd that uh, if this is capitalism, why is it that the greatest beneficiary has actually been a distinctly non-capitalist country called the People's Republic of China? Which, you know, again, you can call it a communist country, you can call it uh, a country that is, uh, you know, sort of uh, expressing the managerial revolution in a very concrete way. But whatever it is, uh, the People's Republic of China is not capitalist. And yet it is the country that, in terms of its wealth, in terms of how it's translated that wealth into military power, has been by far the greatest beneficiary of the global system that's been created uh, since the uh, 1990s. Um, we can also look at, you know, kind of changes that are happening in America's own uh, economy. So you have um, what's happening with the industrial economy is complex. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, we're still, you know, producing a lot of stuff. We still, you know, have um, a lot of, you know, just industrial output. 
Um, but actually, our industrial output tends to be focused in a few things now. Uh, there are a lot of areas where industrial output has you know, sort of declined quite precipitously. Uh, we have what is now thought of as a service sector economy instead of an industrial economy. And again, this is presented as something nice and futuristic and is going to be uh, you know, even better for everyone. It's going to optimize economic efficiency. But actually, if you look at some of the leading uh, sectors of this new service economy, it's rather troubling at what they actually are. So uh, some of the largest forms of employment in the new service economy include healthcare. Well, healthcare is something that's so highly regulated by government that it's almost a quasi-governmental entity in itself. Uh, education, which again, uh, you know, involves so much government that it's something that really uh, is not a traditional capitalist free market entity. Uh, you also see uh, a lot of employment in retail. Well, retail, uh, people working, you know, as cashiers, uh, and then also in, you know, other things like um, uh, working in hotels as maids or, you know, doing other things of that nature. Um, these are, you know, sort of traditional kinds of employment, you know, even in an old-fashioned 19th century capitalist economy. But there are things on which it's very hard to see that you can build a, uh, you know, a free country, right? If people are all employees, you can see that that's going to create a great deal of demand for, you know, minimum wage laws. It's going to create a great deal of demand for all kinds of other government services. That in a traditional um, capitalist economy, you actually want people who uh, have a stake in, you know, sort of buying and selling things, uh, whether they are capitalists or whether they're people who are involved in producing things that are bought and sold. And that as you get away from that and you get to basically uh, this service economy, which, you know, in large part seems very servile, that that's going to have certain repercussions for our politics. That may be one of the reasons why you're seeing, for example, this new rise in Bernie Sanders and uh, uh, sort of democratic socialism here in the United States. So many of the things that even uh, movement conservatives are supportive of, such as um, um, the global economy and the service sector, uh, are actually deeply troubling. And it seems to me that one of the things we've done is we've mistaken economics for the whole of life. And we've mistaken a sort of model form of economics for the actual uh, practices uh, of human life. And again, that when you sort of uh, get away from the theory and the intellectual construct a little bit and look at the empirics and look at how uh, world power and economic, um, the relationship between forms of economy and uh, political freedom, you get to something that's actually much more troubling right now. And you can see why, even though um, grassroots, uh, you know, sort of supporters of Donald Trump, they are lions who may not be able to articulate in a very sophisticated way uh, why they believe the things they believe and what they want to do. Nonetheless, their instincts are correct. They understand that they are under attack and they are responding to that attack by supporting the person they think is most likely to counterattack is most likely not only to defend them, but also to go after the forces that are um, destroying their ways of life. Um, and then, on the other hand, you have uh, a lot of movement conservatives who, um, again, because they have these, you know, and again, it's, it's, we don't want to totally moralize things. You don't want to say that lions are good, foxes are bad. It's more complicated than that. There's some bad things about lions. There's some good things about foxes. But in, in general, there are, you know, sort of certain patterns that emerge from these different types. Uh, a great many movement conservatives are intellectuals who are really foxes. Therefore, they have a hard time even understanding the emotions of the base and why it is that uh, you know voters are tribalistic and why it is they have these you know this defense of the, w the way of life they know uh, instead of embracing you know change and embracing uh, you know just formulas for sustaining the country. One of the things that's characteristic of uh, conservative foxes is that they'll talk about America as an idea. They'll talk about America as a proposition nation. Uh, and that, I mean, <laughs> um, I have a hard time not laughing when I, when I talk about that, simply because that's so profoundly wrong. And, and even the way they look at the founding is profoundly wrong. They'll look at the founding as, hey, you had a bunch of philosophers come together, and they dreamed up this new idea. They wrote the Declaration, and they wrote the Constitution, you know, just out of their heads. And then you got, you know, this wonderful country. Well, in fact, you had this, you know, tradition of centuries. First of all, here in America under the colonies, centuries of self-government uh, to a very high degree, uh, which informed all of these practices. 
And uh, even their intellectual uh, basis was not just something that, you know, they happened to read John Locke and then they declared themselves philosophers and were prepared to, you know, sort of legislate. No, in fact, you know, they had read uh, pretty much the entirety of uh, the Greek and Roman corpus as it was available to them. Uh, these were deeply learned men. These were deeply experienced individuals as well. And they brought together their learning, their experience, as well as some new thoughts to create, you know, a very successful uh, constitution. Uh, America uh, does have an ideational component. It's not just, you know, um, again, this kind of left-wing caricature of, uh, you know, a, a nation as simply a, a blood and soil thing that has to be rejected because it's all founded on race. That certainly is not the case. But it is the case that history and experience uh, and a particular uh, way of life has informed even this country's origins and not just an abstract philosophy. Um, and why do so many movement conservatives get this wrong? Uh, in some cases, it's because they've been miseducated. In some cases, it's because it's kind of comfortable for them to say things that don't upset the left too much. Um, they are respectable conservatives as opposed to people like Donald Trump or people who might have, you know, uh, be willing to defend the lions in some ways. Um, so it's, it's just, uh, you know, it, it's a very comfortable existence. You get to move to Washington, D.C., uh, the cocktail parties don't really exist anymore, but there are still lots of, you know, nice things you get to do in the nation's capital, uh, mingling with people in the center and on the left and deploring the deplorables out in, uh, you know, red state America and so forth. And uh, there's a lot of phoniness involved in, you know, the conservative uh, claim to speak for middle America. Um, and middle Americans knew this, and they responded accordingly in 2016 when they basically said no to all the conservative formula candidates, and they said yes to Donald Trump, who even though Donald Trump you know, could say crazy things about abortion or about, uh, about the welfare state, he could support you know, uh, Social Security or something, um, people said, well, you know what, you know, some of that we can accept, some of that we might reject, but fundamentally we understand this is a guy who's going to fight for us and someone who's going to fight against uh, the intellectuals who are trying to basically destroy the way of life that we've known. Um, you could see that in Nixon. You could see that in Trump. I don't think you could see it so much in some of the other Republican politicians uh, between them. I actually think, to a surprising degree, you could see it in Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan had an optimistic uh, personality, which is a contrast both to Nixon and to Trump. But Reagan actually uh, had that uh, middle American touch as well. And if you look at the horrible things that lefties say about uh, Ronald Reagan's 1980 campaign, Reagan really did connect also with the silent majority. Uh, Reagan was also, you know, very tough on crime. Reagan was also someone who affirmed, you know, kind of America, not just as an idea, but as, you know, something that had a proud heritage. And um, with Reagan, you know, he was able to talk in ways that movement conservatives liked, that intellectuals liked. But he was also able to connect emotionally uh, with the American public, with the lions uh, back in the, uh, the heartland. And so he was very successful on both levels. And I think many intellectuals kind of took the wrong lesson from, from Reagan, because instead of seeing Reagan as the heir to Nixon, which in many ways he was, they saw Reagan instead as, like themselves, uh, a, kind of, um, a kind of intellectual who just happened to you know, read von Mises and therefore was uh, uh, you know, uh, able to get everyone excited about uh, tax cuts and uh, you know, sort of economic uh, prosperity. Um, that's, that's important. You should have tax cuts. You should have prosperity. You need prosperity. But you also need to have a country. Um, so does that cover? I think that covers a lot of ground. Um, covers it in perhaps a way that's hard to you know, sort of take in all at once. But I think that's a good reason for me to sort of draw a line under things here. And then uh, in a more extensive discussion, we can kind of drill down into specifics.